Hello, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to be back. Uh, our partnership with the VRLA team has been as good for us as it has been for them. And I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate them. So far as we can tell, and Daryl and I uh, talked to a lot of people, uh, as far as we can tell, VRLA actually is the world's largest independent VR event. And so congratulations to them, and thank you to all of you which have helped to, to make this uh, come about. I see many familiar faces. So I have three um, messages for you today. The first is that VR isn't a thing, it's going to be everything. And I'm going to build on some of the things that Johnny talked about just now. The second thing I want to tell you is that AMD is your best partner for VR. And yes, I'm sorry, there's going to be a little bit of sales in this presentation. <laughs> and the third thing I'm going to tell you is I think we still need Sonic the Hedgehog. And that will make sense when I get to it. So let's talk about um, VR isn't a thing, it's going to be everything. Uh, in the audience here is a good friend of mine, Anshul Sag, um, who's an analyst. And we recently got into a pretty big argument about the, uh, some of the numbers that are being quoted for the size of VR. And I tended to agree with him that the, perhaps they were too large, they were being exaggerated. However, I started to realize recently that we shouldn't consider how big VR will be based on the number of headsets which get sold, or home users which have it, or how many PlayStation users adopt it. But consider the fact that we are in the middle of emerging a completely new industry. And an industry which will create business opportunities, which will not be directly correlated to the number of headsets which ship. So in the last um, few months since I was last here in August, um, we are now engaging with people using VR to create real estate. Um, people using VR for safety training. I met a, a very nice man last week uh, talking about how he's using VR uh, working with Boeing to reconstruct safety situations. Uh, we're seeing VR used in manufacturing, design, the military, retail, and many other places. So that's led us to come up with a term which we are using internally at AMD, which is VRAS, or VR as a service. We believe that what we're going to see, whether VR is captured with a camera, uh, with cameras like the fantastic one from Jaunt, or whether it's uh, created using game engines, um, using Unity or, um, or CryEngine or Unreal, how it's created is going to vary. But the ability to create new business opportunities uh, because we can approach problems in new ways is going to uh, create this fantastic new industry and will perhaps validate some of the numbers which are being attributed to it. So let me give you a couple of examples. I recently had the pleasure of meeting the team at 8i here in Los Angeles. 8i has developed a camera capture system which can take an actor or an actress, uh, take their face and their animations so that they can then be reused to create entertainment. This is a still shot from the wasteland, which I'm allowed to show here with the kind permission of that 8i team, which is being shown this week in Sundance and demonstrates how the technology works. This is fantastic technology. But I believe it's not just AI which will do this. There'll be competitors and there'll be developers. This alone is going to be by itself a completely brand new industry. And I congratulate them for being a leader in it. Let me give you another opportunity. This is new reality from another company here in, uh, in LA uh, called Neuralize. They realized that when we put the headset on that we're probably going to want to put it on and find ourselves in a comfortable place, a place which is familiar to us. And so they developed a new reality which allows us to put the headset on and then be in our favorite den, our favorite environment, our favorite anything, quite frankly. This will lead, I think, to the development of our real estate in VR. We'll probably want to live next door to our neighbors in VR. Probably the beginning of Oasis for everyone that's read Ready Player One. But don't just take my word for it. I'd like to, uh, to invite somebody to the stage in one second. Last time I was here, I talked about the fact that we're going to need a new tool, set of tool chains that right now creating VR is you put the goggles on, you take them off, you do some code changes, you put them back on, and that's kind of agricultural. And that we really need tools for VR in VR. Well, one company has done just that. So I'd like to introduce on stage my um, good friend Bob Berry, the CEO of Envelop VR. Thank you, Roy. Uh, we really appreciate the leadership uh, AMD and VRLA is showing um, on this new emerging ecosystem. 
when we set, out, set about to create Envelop, um, one of the things that we truly believe is that these immersive technologies are uh, applicable uh, to more than just games and entertainment. While that's really important and that's gonna drive everything, um, this is a fundamentally new um, computing platform. Um, and we're entering this age of, of immersive computing. And we wanted to make sure that we we're creating a, starting out uh, creating a company that is going to solve real world problems and help developers uh, uh, help evolve this ecosystem. And the very first thing that we identified was you can't create VR while you're in VR. And we thought you know, we could do something about that. So the Envelop virtual environment is the first fully immersive uh, computing platform. It takes your entire underlying 2D desktop ecosystem and puts it into VR and explodes it into a, an array of infinite monitors and infinite desktop space. With the Envelop SDK, it allows your applications, both your native legacy 2D applications and web content to continue that and push even further into VR. So you can imagine taking boring old Excel, selecting some data on one of your worksheets, and instead of generating a, you know, a little pseudo 3D pie chart or, or scatter plot, you can actually export a data landscape into, into your VR space, all from regular old Excel. And then you can stand up and you can walk around your data and you can pick up your controllers and manipulate it. And now you're reasoning about a, this data in a completely new and intuitive way that is going to unlock new insights uh, because you're, you're Experiencing the way, experiencing it the way the human brain is meant to experience it. So that's what we're doing at Envelop, and we hope that uh, you'll join us. We've got a closed uh, beta launching at the end of this month. If you'd like to join us, uh, please head to our website, envelopvr.com. Thank you. So now for the sales pitch. Goldman Sachs recently listed seven companies that it thought would be the big winners in VR. And I'm pleased to tell you that one of those was uh, AMD. Now, why would they choose AMD? We have many competitors, and why would they call us out in particular? I think it's because of many of the things which we're doing in VR together with you. Um, but I'm going to call out four particular aspects of the work that we're doing that I want to share with you. The first is our team. The second is our commitment to VR and to all of you in the audience. Our ability to invent and our support for community. So let me talk about the team. By the way, uh, HR contacted me and said, are you sure you want to do this? People might try and recruit them. Uh, don't try and recruit them. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, first, uh, one thing I'd like to do, because of his hard work and his success in VR, we were very proud that recently we were able to uh, give Daryl uh, Sartain a promotion to director. Daryl, you can stand up for a second. second. If anybody doesn't know Daryl, <laughs> Daryl has worked tirelessly Daryl's worked tirelessly to, uh, to support the VRLA team when I just swan around taking people for dinner. Um, we also have Leila Ma. Leila Ma invented uh, Last Latch, which got immediately adopted by Oculus and uh, did a lot of the invention into Liquid VR. Timothy Lotz is another of our inventors. Sasha is working with people for events around the world. Uh, James Knight. Uh, is, where's James? Is he here? James, can you stand a second? This is James Knight, ladies and gentlemen. He's our virtual production director. If you're looking to um, produce content, and I know I get contacted so much that I, I can't honestly get back to everybody uh, anymore, uh, James is helping us to manage our VR projects together with you. I'm also pleased to tell you that we recently opened a VR office in Taiwan, run by Elliot Liu. Uh, we've just opened a VR office in Seattle, run by Roland Gallagher. Uh, we've also opened a VR office in Toronto, run by Ed Colway, um, and an office in London, led by Chris Rose. And in China, 72 hours ago, by the way, I was in uh, Hongzhou um, with Hanjin. So as you can see, we're very committed to a dedicated VR team to support you all around the world. Now, one of the things that I hear back sometimes is, you know, Roy, we really like you, but you've got to do something about those drivers. Drivers are a piece of software which make our products work. Well, I want to tell you, we have done something about our drivers. We've worked very hard on them. We recently released what we call a crimson uh, version of our drivers. And we are also working hard with every major software package that you use to create. Whether it's in capture, whether it's in editorial development, animation, publishing, stitching. 
we're working with all of these companies and optimizing our drivers. I don't want anybody to not use our products anymore because saying our drivers don't work. They're good and they're getting better. I mentioned, that's a little bit about some of the invention. I'm going to tell you some more inventions in a moment. I also mentioned commitment. I'm very proud to tell you that a little while ago, uh, we started work talking to uh, my good friend Chavat Yerli, a CEO of Crytek, about supporting a program for universities around the world. Um, and that program's come to fruition. I'm sure Chavat will be talking about it, so I won't steal any funder there. But we're very proud to be supporting him and his team. And we're very proud that we also just supported uh, the first university in the world to set up a dedicated VR course, which is Bao University from uh, Besiktas in Turkey. Last time I was here, I also uh, promised you that we would make the world's most powerful small computer for developers. Many of you in this room really enjoy using the Falcon Northwest Tiki, as you should. It's a wonderful piece of technology. And we promised you we would take two of our highest-end GPUs and put them inside that tiny box. Well, I'm pleased to tell you we did it. We met our promise. And if you go downstairs, we actually have a demonstration of a dual GPU, 12 teraflops, fastest computer uh, GPU solution in the world inside of a Tiki. It's a feat of engineering we're delighted with. Well, last time I was here, I also said, if you have any projects, please come to us. We want to work with you, particularly if they're exciting, innovative, or new. Um, following that, uh, Dell came to us, together with uh, 360 Live, and said, we want to do a project about, uh, the, called The Lonely Whale to highlight attention to, uh, to what's going on in the oceans. So we partnered with Dell and with HTC, and we delivered that. And we're very pleased. I will make the same commitment to all of you that if anybody in this audience has similar projects, please come and talk to us. We also uh, uh, got in contact with uh, Dr. Skip Rizzo uh, from USC ICT, who is developing some uh, VR under a project called Brave Mind to uh, help in the treatment of PTSD very successfully. We're now working uh, with Skip and his team on a project called Phoenix to refresh the systems. And I'm very excited about that. And we're looking to also pursue other commitments to other uh, areas of medicine. I also have an announcement for you. I don't tend to talk about games so much because I think there's so many other uh, areas of VR, but that doesn't mean that we don't like games. So I have an announcement to make. We are going to partner with Rebellion Software to uh, help produce the PC experience of uh, the Battlezone game in VR. I'm sure many of you in this audience played Battlezone when you were younger, and so we're very pleased that we're working uh, with uh, Rebellion to bring that to VR. But we're also working and partnering with other companies, and so with that, I'm going to introduce you to my second guest, the never forgotten, very memorable, Mr. Amir Rubin from Sixth Sense. Thanks, Roy. Having Roy, having AMD has, as, as dedicated as they are to VR, developing the tools that are required is exactly the, the, the vision that both myself and, and my, my co-founder, Avi Arad, the, the ex-CEO for Marvel Studios and, and the, the, the producer of Spider-Man and Iron Man and many other superhero movies, you know, it, it really takes collaboration of hardware and software companies and, and, and media companies to enable a VR. But as they are all coming together, what I see is the achieving, uh, achieving my dream. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. OK. If you're going to make great VR, you're going to need great software and great tools. Getting the best tools is OK. But if you want to be able to uh, customize those tools and make changes to them, you're going to need some particular access. So I'm pleased to tell you that, effective next week, AMD is launching GPUopen.com. GPUopen.com will consist of software which you can have access to, you can have source code for, which will allow you to customize your applications and accelerate them, including with the full release of Liquid VR. And so we're very pleased that will be available for you. And talking of Liquid VR, I'd also like to thank all of you in the audience who are part of the voting for the um, Advanced Imaging Society Lumiere Award which we received for the invention of Liquid VR, which allows you to accelerate your applications and remove latency, the enemy of VR. Now, 
I'd also like to move on to something else, which I think is very, very interesting for everybody in this room. Right now, if you create VR, you're faced with two choices. You can use an advanced camera to capture the VR, which has the um, attraction that the quality is very high. Or you can use a game engine, which has the attraction that it's interactive. However, the game engine doesn't have the quality of the cameras. But we believe that there's a third way with something we call gaze-activated content. By embedding pieces of video, which you can only see when you uh, look at them, we can create this semblance of interaction. So for example, imagine that you're at lunch, if I was at lunch with you, and I look over and I look at a pretty girl and she winks at me. That would be nice. That would seem to be to be interactive, but if I didn't look at her, she didn't wink, because what we did was we embedded that video. Now I'm pleased to tell you this invention of gaze activated content is available here to see at the show. Mr. Kevin Cornish is a movie director who's actually put together the world's first piece of gaze activated content, and I encourage you to go and see it. Now I'd like to address a, a different um, challenge for us, and that is what's called the total available market. One of the issues we have is the minimum spec for the PCs that will run the Oculus and HTC headset at 90 frames a second at 2K resolution. Now to do that, you need um, either a Radeon GPU, a 290X, or, an, or a GeForce 970, both of which retail for $349. The challenge that we have is if you look at the total number of those GPUs which have sold since they came out onto the market, according to JPR, John Petty Research, that is an installed base of just 7.5 million units. Now that's an issue because it means that you can only sell 7.5 million of anything because that's a store base of people that can run the headsets. And that assumes, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that 100% of them adopt them. And so I'm very pleased to tell you that we've invented something called Polaris, which we think is going to address this problem. Now, in order for Polaris to make sense, I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I'm going to be a little tiny bit technical. I'm going to have to do that for Polaris to make sense. I need to explain to you how chips are made. This is a silicon ingot. Before a chip can be made, this ingot needs to be manufactured. It's then sliced into wafers, and the chip is then effectively photographed onto the wafer, like here, and then this gets chopped up into little squares, which become the chip itself. And then we cover them in chocolate, but well, we don't, we encase them in plastic, and then that becomes a chip. Now, the way that we can produce those chips, the manufacturing process, which makes them small enough, uh, as it continued to evolve. So back here you can see in 2005 we had what's called a 90 nanometer process. This is the relative size of each shrink that we've done. AMD has just completed a shrink to what's called 14 nanometer here. What this means is, and this is where it comes home to everybody in this room, is that we can now produce GPUs which will run the minimum spec of VR at a lower cost, in larger volume, consuming less power and running faster. That means in the second half of this year and going forwards, more people will be able to run those headsets which will make a larger audience for everybody in the room. And we think that's very significant. Okay, that's the sales pitch over. Let me move on to the, uh, the final thing which is around about the need for Sonic the Hedgehog. Every major technological breakthrough had taken off until the killer application came along and followed it. And this goes all the way back to the Gutenberg Bible, to the radio, to the television, to the invention of the internet. And so one of the, th the uh, propositions I want to make is, would Sega have been as successful if it didn't have Sonic? And would there be a Sonic without a Sega? Of course not. We're still looking for the killer application for VR. Now, here's what we do know when you find it. And I want a little abstract here. In 1903, when the Model T Ford came out, it cost $850. The average salary at that time was around 25 cents an hour. So that car cost more than three times your salary. And I imagine, for example, if an Oculus headset today cost $300,000. But here's the interesting thing. Despite the car being so expensive and despite the car having really poor roads, no gas stations or infrastructure, the Model T Ford sold so well that within two years the price dropped to $350. Now why am I mentioning this? What has this possibly got to do with VR? What it's got to do with VR is that when we make the killer app, when we come out with the application 
or the experience or the game that is so fantastically compelling, we will find a way to make that work and get it into our homes, get it into our office. I'm very excited about the partnerships we have with many of you in the room and all around the world in content. But we've yet to really see something that's so compelling that it's going to break through. Although I believe the paranormal activity experience is pretty good. And I encourage everybody to try that downstairs. Now the second reason for that, the need for that great piece of content, is not just that it will help pave the way to VR and open VR up and people will just want to use it, but there's a second reason too. And that is that I believe the bottleneck we have today to great VR is getting budgets to producers and directors and creators that will allow you to make your vision of what VR to be come true. So long as you have a budget of hundreds of thousands of dollars and not tens of millions of dollars, your creative process is going to be stifled to some degree. I believe that what Mike Dunn said from 20th Century Fox said here is absolutely correct. We need the killer apps, we need the killer content so that we can not only help create VR and create a lot of excitement, but create the revenues for it. But we should also not be afraid to do some crazy things. Recently, I was talking to uh, Dr. Skip Rizzo, the guy earlier uh, about uh, PTSD in VR, about could we do some testing to see what would happen if people stay in VR for an hour or two hours over a, a prolonged period. And we were in the middle of talking about this when this happened. This is Thorsten Wiedemann. He said, don't worry about that. He put on a VR headset and stayed in VR for 48 hours. He fell asleep in VR and he woke up in VR. He lived on uh, protein shakes um, and showed that it could be done. What's amazing about this and exciting to me is that he didn't wait for our test results to come out. He just did it. And that thrills me. And it thrills the team at AMD. So I think we should dare to do some different things and, and act wacky and do some crazy stuff. And I encourage everybody in the room to do that, though maybe to not to this extent. <laughs> so... Um, in conclusion, but before I wrap up, I promised you that we would get Radion's work in a tiki. Well, I'm pleased to tell you that we did. So, where's that other mic? One of you, if you like to look under your seat, and this is where the people that walked out are going to really regret this, um, under your seat, one of you is going to find a ticket. A lucky gentleman down there has won a Falcon Northwest Tiki with a Radeon. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>